I'm Debbie Love Ortark, Editor of Employee Benefits, and welcome to this Employee Benefits Wired. Today's debate will focus on the changing pensions landscape. In November, we published our annual pensions research in association with Close Brothers Asset Management. This identified some of the key trends currently impacting pensions. But what do these really mean for employers operating workplace schemes? To help answer this question, I'm joined today by Jeanette Makings, Head of Financial Education Services at Close Brothers Asset Management, Natasha Horsall, Pensions Manager at the University of Lincoln, and Charles Cotton, Reward and Performance Advisor at the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development. Now, many employers are due to experience pensions auto re enrolment for the first time next year. But what opportunities does this really present for employers and uh, the, what potential pitfalls do they need to be aware of? Jeanette, I know this is something you've had some experience of. Yes, so I think I think the, the most important thing to start with is they've been through it once. So uh, whatever worked in their organisation, whatever didn't work uh, in terms of engagement, communication, uh, the things that, that got the most uptake, uh, the feedback they had from their staff, uh, but also functionally, from a functional perspective, uh, looking at the system they used, uh, if they've got some time before that happens, which they have, it's about talking to their provider if they're using some software talking to their provider, getting those wrinkles out of the way uh, that they've experienced really over the last sort of two and a half to three years. Um, and I think the other important thing to say is lots of employers, particularly the ones that have been through it already, um, recognise that actually this isn't just something which is a box ticking exercise. This is a way to really engage people with their pensions, which is what employers want. Uh, and so really it's about looking at it from that perspective as an opportunity to engage with the pension as opposed to something that complies with the legislation. Thank you. And Charles, I know this is also something you've been doing quite a bit of work on recently. Yes, I think it's a, a great opportunity for organisations to step back and think strategically about the pension scheme, what's it trying to achieve if the business objective is you know, great customer satisfaction or product innovation, how is the pension scheme supporting those objectives? Um, secondly, looking at things like the operational um, aspects of the pension scheme, you know, what's member feedback, is the customer service good? Um, you know, are people understanding how it works? And also things like, you know, the, the fund charges. Um, more money has been going into the pension scheme. Is it an opportunity to perhaps negotiate a, you know, a, a better deal on behalf of your employees? And then perhaps finally looking at looking at the measures. Um, what measures are you collecting from the pension scheme, such as um, how much people are contributing, what's the average CIs of the pension part? Again, you know, some metrics about um, satisfaction levels. And then looking at by you know gender, grade, age, and then looking at that from you know are we getting a return from our pension investment, both our employees and our employers, uh, and the employer contribution. Great. And obviously, with pensions auto enrolment, that was many employees' experience, a first experience of being enrolled into a workplace scheme. So, how can employers really then engage those staff with pensions and encourage them to be more proactive about their retirement savings? Now, Natasha, that must be something you've experienced. It is. I think it's about having a pensions champion, someone that can really engage the staff um, to help them understand, to demystify the whole pensions arena. It's something that we've done in terms of financial education, but we've not targeted it in terms of pensions specifically. So, it's encouraging people people to look at their financial well-being, um, their, their health, their, their career, and look at the whole package. Good. And I know, Jeanette, that's something you've done quite a bit of work on. Yeah, we have. I think in the research, the research shows, I think, a, a lovely byproduct, really, of the pension reforms, uh, and I think perhaps a byproduct that perhaps nobody really expected, is that a number of companies, I think it's 27 per cent, uh, are looking at it as an opportunity to engage all staff, not just those who are approaching retirement. And I think that, get, that kind of goes back to, to, to what we were saying earlier, which is why is a pension there? What's it there to do? Uh, and employers want that pension to be part of the reward, part of the total reward. They want it to um, bring staff to them, bring talent to them, retain the staff that they want to retain, motivate and engage them, uh, and, and really to help them see the benefits of that employer uh, and how much they value them. So I think 
they really want, uh, an employer really wants to engage their whole workforce. Uh, you know, saving for retirement doesn't just happen at retirement, it happens right from the word go. So I think really things like um, financial education, communications, championing in it through there. And I think also the employer being a big sponsor of it. If it comes from the top down, right from the, right from the CEO, right from their branch manager, right from their line manager, if everybody is seen to be really the champion of this, uh, to encourage people to take it up. Great. And Charles, I know you've had some thoughts on this as well. Well, I think it's just kind of looking at the, um, the measures um, over the three year period and seeing, well, are you hope you know achieving what you hope to achieve and are there any weak points so for instance it may be possible that younger people aren't engaging as much um, as you would hoped now is that because of they've got other spending commitments and it's so how can you help them um, through that perhaps through you know better budget budgeting or, or um, you know, money management um, programs, or is it, you know, the way you communicate and engage with them? You know, uh, many organizations are now looking at online apps, looking at pension modelers so people can carry out what if scenarios. And I think if you kind of make it more personalized and people feel more in control um, about what their aims and you know, ambitions are coming towards retirement, then that can actually create um, engagement itself. That actually brings me nicely onto another topic that we're seeing a huge amount in the industry at the moment is how can in the industry as a whole and employers in particular really increase trust in pensions as a brand? Um, Natasha? I think it's about um, encouraging ownership. So a lot of our staff um, have little knowledge of their pensions. So by encouraging them to take ownership of that, taking an interest in, in how much pension they, they've built up, um, the choices of funds that they invest in, um, they can have uh, more input into how their pension. Um, and because it, it's theirs, they're hopefully they will, they will find that trust. But also I think it's the, the employer um, to this responsibility to help uh, promote the scheme, to build that trust. Great. And Jeanette, what are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think employers particularly, uh, you know, that there's still some legacy where they want to look after their staff and providing a great pension is a way to do that. But I think it's also moving towards this, particularly with defined contribution schemes, it's moving towards this shared responsibility, employer and employee. And I think, um, again, that comes from the employer and I think information and education and putting some tools in place, as Charles said, such as looking at sort of savings modelers and what that might mean if they change this and change that. But I also think there's some fundamentals there. Uh, I think there's a lot of employees out there who don't really understand perhaps a lot about the pension. They don't understand the choices that are in front of them. They don't understand if they change this, what happens as a result of that. And I think that's scary, that first step towards sort of having a look at that. So I think things like financial education, seminars, online information, tools, case studies, that sort of thing, they're really helpful to break those barriers down. And I think people can then access what they need as they need it and multiple times as well if they need to. Charles, you're nodding along to that there. Yes, yes, I, mean, I agree with well, everything. I mean, I also think that you know, there's a role for the industry as well. Um, you know, the, uh, the sector has come in for um, some kind of criticism, you know, perhaps some of it deserved, some of it undeserved. And I think we need to have more openness and transparency. So if people can see, for instance, how much they're paying for their pension, um, what the fees and charges are made up of, um, how that compares to other, you know, schemes as well. That will kind of give them a better idea that, you know, that they um, are not being perhaps taken, take, taken for a ride. And also um, the people who represent the industry as well. I mean, um, it tends to be from a certain demographic of the population isn't kind of represent um, the UK workforce as it is now. And again, it, you know, the industry thinking, well, how can we attract more people into it that represents um, you know, the, the, the workforce as a whole? Yeah, and one of the issues we touched on there was the need for advice and education, but one of the things we're seeing, and it certainly came out in the research, is that people are relying more on family and friends for advice. So how can we ensure that more people are able to access the advice that they need um, at an affordable price, particularly up to 50, oh, those over the age of 55? <laughs> uh, well, I, th I think... 
I think actually the interesting fact there is not everybody will need advice necessarily at all stages of their career. Um, certainly when they actually start taking their pension, more people will need advice because they spent their lifetime accumulating it and some of the decisions can be uh, you know, irretrievable. So that's the point at which more people will need it. But earlier on in their career, I think people, if they're given the right information, they're given guidance through ed financial education and such like, they're given the right support by their employer, a lot of them will feel comfortable in making some decisions uh, along the way without advice. Uh, and so I think there's a segmentation model there that happens. And I think that needs to be at the, at the individual level rather than at the employer level. Um, but I do think, I think, you know, advice is being talked about a lot. The industry's changed significantly uh, since the retail distribution review, uh, our new regulator and so on. Uh, I think there's more probably to be looked at in that in terms of best practice. But I think you'll find some advisors um, and, and probably the, the, the sort of more experienced ones out there uh, who have more um, more uh, opportunities for the ways in which people can engage with them, whether that be um, I'm not, I'm not going to use the word robo-advice, whether that can be over the phone, whether that can be via video conference. So it reduces the cost. And then there will be some advisors who can look at very specific advice. So looking at very specifically just about pension savings, just about pension investment funds, etc. Um, and looking at sort of people's attitude to risk and, and that sort of thing and helping them with guidance and modelers to look at what's right for them. And Charles, do you think that's something the industry as a whole should be doing a lot more of. Yes, I mean, um, as, as you said um, earlier, I suppose it depends who your family and friends are. If it's mm -hmm. Steve Webb, you're probably laughing all the way to the bank. But for many of us, we don't have, we don't, we're not in such a lucky um, situation. And to a certain extent, you know, it, it's understandable that people turn to their family and friends because they're seen as somebody they can trust, potentially impartial, um, whilst, the, you know, perhaps that isn't what they think when they think of the pension industry or the uh, or IFAs, they perhaps may be out for it for, you know, whatever reason, um, you know, the particular um, agenda or, or product to push. So I think we need to kind of, for the industry to kind of help get over that. But yes, absolutely, things like um, online modelers and, um, you know, um, which allows people to kind of scenario plan what if, if I, you know, stay in work for another three years, if I increase my contributions by £100, pounds, um, if I kind of started to increase my pay through a, um, a save more for tomorrow approach, you know, what could that impact that have on, um, on, on the amount of money I'll have when it comes to, comes to retirement? Um, but also look at it, you know, more holistically as well, thinking, well, um, there's a bigger, wider debate around financial well-being, everything around you know, how much you've got for your retirement, your financial education and awareness, um, risk benefits, as well as how those um, that pay and those benefits are allocated. Are they allocated in a fair and, and, and just manner? And Natasha, I know that's something you've done quite a lot of work around at the University of Lincoln. Could you just tell us more about some of the education that you provide? Well, we um, have been providing financial education for all of our staff, so right from our interns that, that start with us um, through to those that are approaching retirement. And we're also looking to extend that out to our students because we see a very real gap in the market there in terms of their knowledge, making them prepared for when they go into the workplace, um, that they understand how pensions but also how tax you know how savings work um, so it's a big part of our financial education program uh, and we found that originally we uh, talked around pensions but we didn't get that level of engagement um, so hopefully by explaining really fairly simplistic things that people can understand and it makes a big difference so whether it's to do with their tax code whether it's to do with savings rates uh, whether it's to do with whereabouts they can find that information it just helps encourage engagement it also helps to encourage people to talk to each other um, so they can spread the word about we you know attended some financial education found this useful um, and can get the information that way great now, one thing all three of you have touched upon today is the growth of technology. So, do you think that's likely to have a greater impact on pensions going forward? And if so, how do you see that developing? Well, I think um, it's going to help the industry. Um, the new technology will help drive down costs, and hopefully, that will start to be passed on in, in, in lower, you know, charges and um, more innovative ways of engaging and communicating with with pension members. 
but also you know for, for employees and, and you know, pension members themselves being able to access um, things from their smartphone um, will you know when it's convenient for them will make 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 a big impact. Um, look at kind of the behavioural science of decision making. Often people feel forced into making a snap decision um, about you know pensions or whatever and don't necessarily make um, an informed decision. So we need to give people um, more time to kind of reflect on what's important and by giving people a multitude of ways of okay. um, accessing the pension scheme and thinking about it and making decisions then I think they'll be for, uh, more confident about what they're going to do. I also think the use of like modelers on websites can really help people understand, you know, if it's in a pictorial fashion mm. rather than just a written, um, you know, statement that they received, and that they can use those modelers to um, give examples of what their pension might look like in the future if they were able to save more or their salary went up, for example. I think I think it's important that I mean, the te not some technology exists and has been around for a very long time. There have been pension modelers around for s such a long time. But I think it's also worth noting one channel isn't going to do everybody. People learn in different ways. They take in information in different ways. Some people like to learn by playing with things. Some people like to learn by being shown and told. Uh, and also communication is not one-dimensional as well. So you've got to look at your employee, employee workforce, see what works for them, see the sort of people that you've got, the culture that they're in, the culture that you're in and use multiple methods of communicating and for them to be able to use it in ways that suit them. Great. Now we've just had our first question in from the audience. So why has the Chancellor delayed the increase in pension contributions by six months when the idea of auto-enrolment was to encourage employees to start saving from their retirement? Um, delaying the increase results in less money being paid in the employee pension pot over in the six month period. So do you think that was just to satisfy the employer? Who would like to take that one? Well, I'll start. I, I, I don't think we know uh, what, what, what was in the Chancellor's mind, what was in uh, the Treasury's mind. But I think um, it may have been some feedback uh, from the, the marketplace, from providers. Uh, employers have had a lot to deal with over the last few years. Uh, you know, they've had to deal with auto-enrolment. They've had to deal with the pension reforms. They're about to have to deal with lifetime and annual allowances. Uh, they've had to deal with real-time reporting. There's a lot they've had to do. And that, that is significant. They've had to change a lot of their systems and processes to do that. So it may have been that there was some feedback from employers just saying we need a bit more time to adjust to this. Uh, and, and I think um, whatever the Chancellor does, it's a balancing act between the consumer, the individuals out there, uh, employers, the industry, and also obviously uh, the government and the country balancing the budget. So I think it will have been a, a combination of things. Yes, I mean, I think, um, as, you, as Jeanette said, you know, employers are facing lots of um, initiatives at the moment, including uh, the introduction of the uh, national living wage. But I think many organisations actually are already paying more than they need to anyway. So I think it's the um, the small and, and uh, medium-sized organisations that perhaps will be more affected uh, by this um, delay, you know, this six-month extension. Now, Jeanette, you just touched upon the lifetime and annual allowance limits that are due to change from early next year. What do you think the likely impact of that is and what issues do employers really need to consider ahead of time? Well, I think in terms of the annual allowance, I think uh, HMRC estimated that as 300,000 plus. Uh, I don't think there's an up-to-date figure for those affected by the reducing lifetime allowance on, on the website, but um, it's, not, it's not just going to affect... Uh, those who are higher earners uh, and those with, um, you know, that are senior management, although it will affect many of those. Uh, there are some people who've got very large, for example, defined benefit um, pots, who because of the uh, calculations, they will be affected as well. So I think that's a, a big issue, I think, for employers is recognising who's actually going to be impacted by this so they can put some help in for those to understand that and help them to see what their choices are and what's available to them. So I think given that this is going to come in from the 6th of April uh, and we are now on the 1st of December, really it's a very much a pressing thing in terms of time. So if you think about communications, communications really need to be going out now with perhaps some guidance in January so that there's February and March to be doing any form of implementation to help those people in that position. Because there's a number of people for whom they've got unused um, allowances that they could carry forward or even use up 
Uh, and obviously the time to do that is before uh, the 6th of April or to use them going forward to defer the impact of that for another few years. Great, thank you. And Natasha, is this something you've experienced? It is, and in actual fact, this, uh, the senior managers are probably one of the hardest groups mm -hmm. that we have to, to target to, to raise awareness. Um, they're very busy, uh, you know, that they don't have an awful lot of time. And so for us, it's important that we do help them understand this fairly complex area uh, and we're finding that people that are on not significant salaries but because of the nature of our schemes and the fact that they've got significant amounts of service in the pensions that uh, uh, as Janet mentioned about the calculations that if they are making any additional contributions then they can exceed these allowances. Um, also we find that where people come for a promotion and their, their, their salary has increased then they may actually find that they were resulting in a tax charge when they you know, thought they were getting a, a pay rise. And so that's really important that we raise that awareness. But also it's, it's difficult to step over that uh, by giving guidance and information, um, but then there's a line to be drawn about actually giving financial advice from an employer's point of view. Yes, and I think there are you know, employee relations issues as well. I mean. You know, many organisations have given their senior employees extra money mm -hmm. to kind of compensate them for the, um, you know, the reduced allowances. Now, as Jeanette has explained, it's going to impact on more staff. And is the organisation going to compensate them you know, as, as well? And if they don't, there's going to be issues. And if they do, what about the rest of the employees? Are they going to say, well, you know, there's one rule for one group of staff and another rule for others and then you open this slippery slope then if you treat everybody the same do you have to make changes every time um, in, you know the government changes the tax rules around for instance um, company cars are you going to compensate them for that or are you going to compensate people for the um, removal of the child you know, tax um, you know the ch 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 um, child care vouchers things like that so um, I think organizations need to be very careful about um, how they respond to these changes definitely you talked about sort of um, tax relief and tax, different tax efficient benefits there, but do you think the Chancellor should provide additional incentives for employers who face increased pension costs, for example, as a result of auto enrolment? Um, I know it's something the ACA suggested recently, possibly in the form of reduced national insurance. Well, anything that can that can help, obviously, um, you know, I'd welcome. But you know, you've got to realise that the amount of money that the, at the government's dispo you know, disposal is quite limited and there's competing um, demands on that and if there is going to be um, you know, some money that is available perhaps it should be perhaps targeted at specific organisations or in particular sectors um, where perhaps these are perhaps more challenging. Um, so that, that's what I'd do. I'd be a bit, um, Obviously, there's always the temptation for the Chancellor to tinker with everything every time there's a spending review or, or a budget. So hopefully, I would hope that this time the, he may refrain uh, from changing the goalposts yet again. Good. We've actually just had a second question coming from the audience. Um, Natasha, you mentioned the steps that the University of Lincoln has taken to engage students with pensions. What would be the most effective way for employers to engage graduates who are ready in the workplace? Oh, for example, if people who are on their graduate scheme? Well, I think it's a, it's, it's a series of, uh, of approaches. So um, we find that direct communication and one-to-one, -one, and I think that was displayed in, in the survey, uh, is definitely uh, one of the best, if most effective ways, although it's not always practicable depending on the size of the, the institution or the organisation. Um, but it, it's creating a, a, an awareness uh, uh, of the issues that they need to, to deal with and so that's what we're trying to do for our, our graduates um, so we do a lot around employability and uh, getting them to think about the whole benefits package not just what the salary is involved um, to help them look at the pension the, the holidays you know health care cars all that kind of uh, thing from, from our perspective I think what we find is when, when, when new employees are coming into any workforce they go through some form of induction plan uh, whether that's technical training or whether it's just finding their way around the office or whatever it may be uh, and so tagging something in at that point is a really good way to do it uh, and to start really talking to them about their benefits to introduce their whole benefits to them but more importantly how to use those benefits to actually uh, make their financial well-being better. Uh, and if, if you start at the beginning, really, you're setting up good benefits habits right from the word go. 
So if they know if they don't know much different, if you set up those good habits from the start, they understand where to go for more information, where to go for more help, uh, and they can start off on a good foot. Yes, I'd agree. It's all about <coughs> habits, encouraging people to um, over time to almost automatically make um, decisions based on what they know is, is, is the right thing to do rather than um, not making any decisions at all or perhaps thinking it's all too complex and I might make the wrong one or go and ask my family and friends. Great. Now, I just wanted to go back on a couple of questions just to pick up on an issue we mentioned earlier, was discussed earlier, around pension charges. Do you feel that it's still too opaque and do we need to do more to increase transparency as an industry around the charges? I don't think it's just about charges. So I think there could, that there's always more that could be done around uh, the communications from providers, for example, the annual statement, uh, to make them easier to understand. And I think charges is a big part of that, but also understanding what they're looking at, the contribution levels, where that is particularly going forward in regard to their annual, uh, uh, possibly even lifetime allowance limits, uh, and also what that's going to mean in the future. So if they are showing a model, a future model performance, they need to understand what's that, what that's based on, that it isn't in the bank, that money at that point. It is just an estimate and what the, what the estimates are based on the criteria underneath it. Well, yes, I mean, it's part, perfectly possible to have a, a cheap... For, um, I suppose charge and actually having a really rubbish performing fund and, and vice versa. But again, I think it goes back to this whole idea of trust. If the perception is that the, all, the industry is hiding something um, for whatever reason, then I think that is going to reflect badly because employees will say, well, what are they trying to hide? Um, and may start thinking, well, I'll go and stick my money into an ice or into a house because I know what I'm going to get with that, even though you could argue there are other charges associated with those um, decisions as well, which aren't particularly um, uh, clear at times. So again, I, th I just think it's important for the industry to kind of say, look, this is what we're spending, um, you, you know, the, your, your money that you're paying in fees, this is what it's going on. But also, yes, it's important, you know, how much money you put into a pension scheme is going to have far more of an impact on your total, you know, pension pot and your retirement income then perhaps going with a scheme which charges 0.5 rather than 0.6. I think, I think that's a really important point. Mm. I think um, people can focus on the charges and the cost of things without really also comparing that to the value. Uh, and I think it's very important to look at all aspects of it. So to see not only the costs, I think it is imperative that people can see the costs. So I think it's imperative that there is transparency but also that they understand what they're looking at. So that's, that's even more imperative. But alongside that, they understand what they're getting for those costs and actually the value that they're getting out for that. Natasha, how do you deal with that as an employer? Um, well, because we offer DB pension schemes currently, um, the, the charges are all, all assumed in, in that. Um, so we don't really have a great deal to do with the management charges. No. Just one final question, so we're very nearly out of time, but following the autumn statement last week, um, I know everybody's got an opinion of what the Chancellor's likely to do next. So what advice would you each have for the Chancellor as he prepares the 2016 budget? Do you think he should leave pensions tax relief well alone, for example, or what changes would you really like to see? So start with you, Charles. I'd like him not to do anything, really. I mean, just <laughs> let everything bed in. Um, when we were consulting with our members about the uh, proposals on the tax relief, one of the things that did come up was um, the distrust of in politicians um, making short-term uh, decisions um, over what something that was essentially a long-term product, and was there some way of taking these decisions out of politics and perhaps setting up an independent uh, commission? Uh, made up of you know the great and the good, but you know representing uh, consumers in the industry and the employers, um, etc. And thinking, well, what do we need to do to have a sustainable long-term um, policy? Looking both at um, workplace pensions um, and and the state pension and, as well. I think. He's invited a consultation. The consultation's closed. He's said that he's going to announce what's come out of that consultation in, in the budget next year. Uh, I, I think um, 
from the sort of reports that I've seen about the, the consultation documents that went in, I think a lot of uh, a lot of the ones that I've seen certainly have said it isn't perfect, but we'd rather have this uh, the way it is without any further changes. I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's important uh, if there is going to be change that it is gradual uh, and that there is some time for people to adjust to it, uh, both employers, consumers, communication uh, and so on. So I think it's very important if there is to be change, it's well, it's well signposted, uh, it's very clear, um, it, it involves all the people that it's going to impact uh, and that it's actually phased in at a very long time frame. And Natasha, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think it's always good to embrace change, but you know, I'd echo uh, both comments here that it's it's it, it it's very difficult for employers. They, they've had a very difficult time over the last um, few, good few years in terms of the reforms. And, and it's a real challenge to be able to uh, to keep up with those changes. Um, but also, I think it's really important that we don't disincentivize our higher earners from pensions, uh, encourage them to then opt out of the scheme, which would then have a knock-on effect, effect, I fear. Great. Lovely. Well, that's all we've got time for. I'd just like to say a big thank you to all of our panellists, Jeanette Makings, Natasha Horsall and Charles Cotton. Um, an on-demand version of this debate will be available on employbenefits.co.uk shortly. Thank you for watching. <laughs>